Zen, welcome to Politics Aside. This edition is, comes at a very special time as we're on the eve of Veterans Day. Uh, today, really more than ever, gives us an opportunity to reflect, to appreciate, and to say thank you to men and women that have served our community and our state and our country for so many years. And, you know, politics aside is just that. We put politics aside and talk to individuals that I believe have helped change the world uh, that are personal friends of mine as well. But most important, uh, I do believe that uh, our guest today, not only as a, as a dear friend of mine and a mentor of mine, we work uh, on projects together with individuals with disabilities. But today, I, I want to make the, a formal introduction to my special guest and good friend, Brigadier General Robert P. Daniels. Uh, the general is one of the more modest individuals that I know uh, and seldom talks about all of the great things that he's done to serve, again, our community and, and our nation and the world. Uh, so I want to take a moment and just walk through quickly because, my gosh, General, there are a lot of wonderful things that you've done. Uh, undergraduate and master's from Utah State, U.S. Army Command uh, staff and uh, staff general and staff college. U.S. Army War College, uh, a National Security Fellow at JFK School of Government, Harvard, an adjunct professor at BYU, and one of the more difficult things is, is to be confirmed by the U.S. Senate uh, for anything, right? Uh, to be confirmed is a huge honor, and it, again, a, a credit to you for your hard work for, from the U.S. Senate confirmed as a Brigadier, Brigadier General. Quickly, on the civilian side, uh, you, you, you had a passion in serving the community from vocational rehab, uh, working with individuals with disabilities through U the state of Utah, through a Ability One program where we work on projects together every day. Uh, also, a pioneer in re rehabilitation services and again, helping individuals that need help the most. Board member of a great organization called Source America, but also, uh, as time permits, a hot shot crew member for the U.S. Forest Service, where, where you served jumping out of airplanes, <laughs> uh, six seasons uh, serving our nation as well. So with that, General, uh, get your thoughts as we're on the eve of uh, Veterans Day, and what does it mean to you? Uh, thank you, Congressman Porter. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, I think that uh, starting off with Veterans Day, I think it's uh, <clears throat> as a small as a, a small child. I can remember uh, being with my grandparents, and and my my grandpa served in World War One, and my father served in World War Two. But they talked about Armistice Day, and you know, I I was uh, didn't really know what they were talking about. You know, I just what's Armistice Day? But then as, as I grow, grew older and, and come to create more fondness for people that had served in our military, uh, I do want to mention that in 1954, uh, President Eisenhower uh, changed Armistice Day to Veterans Day. And so we've been celebrating Veterans Day on November 11th since 1954. Uh, a lot of things have happened since 1954. You know, we've, we've had uh, the Vietnam War, we've had the Cold War, uh, we had the War on Terrorism, we, we, uh, and we continue to, to uh, use our military in, in uh, peacekeeping. Uh, I think we're a, a peacekeeping nation. We're not wanting to be a, a war-seeking nation. And I think examples of that's what's going on with our peacekeeping efforts in Ukraine and in, in uh, Israel. Uh, so one thing I would say, if I don't get a chance to come back to this, uh, every community probably, or within probably 20 miles of where everybody lives, unless they're really out in the, uh, the woods, is that there's celebrations in all the communities that's going to happen mostly probably on Saturday, but Tomorrow we're honoring Veterans Day as Friday holiday. So uh, I would request that maybe, and even if it's after Veterans Day, for anybody that watches this podcast, that they would seek out 
some veteran they know, and I think everybody knows a veteran, and, and a lot of them are family members. And just take a moment and thank them for their service. And, and if they're willing to open up, have a conversation about what their service meant to them and, and what it means to them still today. So that that's would probably be the big would, would be my big ask is to to say give appreciation to somebody that's served um uh, go ahead yeah, th thank you general uh, and if i can comment you know my father rest his soul served in world war ii in the aleutian islands in alaska and he didn't really want to talk about that experience although he, he certainly was proud to serve his country but he never was very comfortable. And I find I've found that with veterans through the years uh, that it, it's a part of their life. They're proud of it, but they don't really. My dad specifically didn't really want to talk about a whole lot until uh, almost a year before he passed away uh, unexpectedly. But it always made me feel very proud of him and everything. And, and again, that it's important that we share your experiences. Uh, because, you know, a lot of veterans don't want to talk about it. Do, do you find that general or is that was that unique to me? No, I, I think that's I think that's the rule. And I think that the rule is more, you know, it's easy to talk about your experiences in peace, peacetime. Uh, and, you know, those those experiences are very easy to speak to. But if, if you're if and I never did experience combat, so I. But I, my father did, and he suffered for P, from PTSD. Uh, they called it battle fatigue back then. But he, 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 I was watching a movie once called Combat when I was young, you know, a teenager. I remember that show. <laughs> and he come down, it was, the TV was in the basement. He came down and turned off the TV and said, I couldn't watch that anymore. And he, he just kind of was starting to have a, a fit that I was watching it. And, and what that all and it took me a long time in, into my adulthood to figure out that what was really going on was it was bringing back experiences that, of PTSD that he did. It was bad for him to have it on. It wasn't so bad for me to watch, but it was, for him, it was really bringing back experiences he didn't want to remember. So, you know, I, I think those are the experiences that uh, that people have a hard time with. And PTSD is real, you know, and I. You know, they used to call it battle fatigue, get over it. You know, you're, you're, you're weak and that kind of thing. But that's that's not what PTSD is. It, it's a real, it's a real, uh, you know, it, it, it's it, uh, it's a crippling disease that the individuals have suffered. You know, and it's not only in military combat, anything, you know, traumatic stress syndrome. So uh, that, I think, is, is real. And uh, so I never was able to really talk to my dad. He served on in the in the uh pacific campaign and he was on okinawa and he never would tell me anything about it and if i even brought it up it was like we're not going there so uh i i learned probably by the time i was 14 years old you didn't talk about what he did in the military <laughs> and, and to give you an example of that uh, and I think I give it as an example. He passed away when he was 86 years old and he was in a, an assistive living center. And I put together a, a shadow box that had his campaign medals and, and where he served. And, and he, he, he had two purple hearts. He had uh, the bronze star, the silver star. And I put it in the shadow box and I was, you know, I was probably, you know, in my late forties, early fifties. And, and I took it to his room and put it in his room and hung it on the wall and was just proud as I could be that I was recognizing for his service. I came back the next day and it was gone. And, it, and I says, what happened to the shadow box? And he says, I can't look at it. I put it in the, in the closet and I would appreciate it if you'd take it home. So, I mean, so what, what my point is, is, you know, he was on Okinawa in 1944. He passed away in 2008 and it still haunted him, you know, so it, it's, it's real. 
Well, and then the changes he must have seen, of course, through the years, and then the changes. So was that part of your inspiration then to to uh, join the military, to join the Guard? Well, I think my inspiration was, my dad told me that I would not join the, he would not allow me to join the, the military. You know, that was not something that I needed to do. I, and the, the lottery came out and I got a low lottery number. And I still had a school deferment. And so when when my lottery number came up, I was like, I think at 190 and, the, and they were going to like 195. So in, De so in December, I was... Uh, I lost my deferment because I was in graduate school. I was getting a master's degree at Utah State. And I found out there was openings in the, the Idaho National Guard. So I drove to Burley, Idaho, which is about a two-hour drive, and, and, and joined the National Guard. And I just figured I would be there for six years. And But then after I got in, went to basic as enlisted, and... At AIT, I was a, a trained to be a, a, a tank, you know, an armored cab tank driver, and uh, and I decided I went out on a FTX field training exercise in the desert in Idaho, and came back and had more more dirt on my face than I had on when I was fighting forest fires for the Forest Service, and I said. I don't want to drive tanks anymore. I'm going to OCS. So I applied for OCS and then got a commission and uh, found out that, that the military wasn't like my dad had explained the military to be. You know, it, it was it was an opportunity to, to grow and develop. And, and after I got my commission, I just, you know, my six years was up. I could have got out, but I stayed in and and, you know, it created all kinds of opportunities. Uh, you know, I mean, I can remember when I got, I applied for the War College, which is in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And I got a notice that, that, that uh, I wasn't selected to attend the War College, but in lieu of the War College at Carlisle, I could go to be a National Security Fellow at the Kennedy School at Harvard, and and, uh, and congratulations on that. That is not an easy <laughs> task. Yeah, and and all I could say to myself is, "How do you say no to Harvard?" You know, and so I I ended up. That was probably one of our. I, I moved the family back to Boston. We lived there for uh, thirteen months, and and uh, it was a great growing experience, not only for me and intellectually but with the military but also uh the family had a whole different experience i mean you know what utah is boston's not and what boston is new utah's not kind of thing you know it one's in the desert one's by the ocean one's humidity one's dry <laughs> you know it's kind of like las vegas yes it's in nevada, DC. <laughs> nevada utah but yes it's a dry heat i promise general it's a dry heat yeah. uh, is there in your experience, is there, is there some, like, one or maybe a couple of things, but mostly a, a priority in your life, having served, that you'd like to share with our listeners today? Well, I think probably a, one of the things I would like to share is I think that the, um, the public uh, as a whole, from my from my perception, believes that the the military is, you know, is an aggressive branch of our organized, you know, our, our government that, uh, you know, fights our wars and, <clears throat> and wins our wars and that, but I also, I want to say that just as important, our military is a peacekeeping force. And if, one looks at what we're doing in the world, a lot of what we're doing is, is peacekeeping. It's not engaged in conflict. And I believe in, in most all cases, those in, in most all cases, those individuals that are serving in the military uh, 
serve because of the peacekeeping part of what we do, not because of they want to be in combat. Well, I guess in following your career uh, as a true public servant, uh, I know a passion for you for years and years has been helping individuals with disabilities or individuals that need help the most. Uh, you worked, as I mentioned earlier, with the state of Utah, uh, then uh, uh, other organizations that you help create, uh, Pioneer Re Rehabilitation Center, and again, as I mentioned today, currently your second term as a board member with Source America, whose primary charge is finding employment for individual, helping find employment through nonprofit community uh, for veterans as well as others that have uh, challenges. C can you talk about that transition? When did you decide that was going to be your mission in parallel with your public service? Well, I think it it started in uh, it was again trying to avoid the military. <laughs> you know, the Vietnam was still going. The lottery came out, and I graduated from Utah State, and I decided that. I didn't want to get drafted is probably the big thing. And so I decided that I would apply for graduate school and join, get into ROTC because they have the, the graduate degree I wanted to get was a two year degree and ROTC is a four year program, but they have a two year program. And so I was going to join the two year program. But I was wanting to get a, a master's degree in history, and I changed my mind and decided I wanted to go into special education. So I applied for a fellowship in special education. I got the fellowship, and I was in graduate school when they had the lottery. So my deferment was gone, but the lottery was came out and hoping I'd get a high number, then I would never need to worry about it, which, you know, it's kind of interesting that probably the thing I was try, trying to avoid was the military, which has been one of the strongest blessings I had in, in, in my life was to be able to serve and serve this great nation that we're, we live in and, and the freedoms that we, we speak for. So any, so to, to go forward, I got a master's degree in special education and got a job teaching at a local high school and coaching football and baseball as assistant football coach and baseball coach for high school. And I was in seventh heaven, you know, and I was, and uh, then a, a group of individuals in, this is 1974, uh, came and asked me if I would start it. A, a program for adults, a work program. Because my master's thesis was on work study, you know. So they, and so we, there was twelve individuals that were living in the community that had come out of the institution, and we started. We call it Park, the Pioneer Adult Rehabilitation Center. Started Park. It was called the Development Davis County Development Center, but you know, as things change, you know, the name's got to change because. <laughs> And, yeah. and so we started out in 1974 with 12, 12 clients, and I had a $25,000 grant. That was to pay three staff, and that was including me with a total of $25,000, I think. I, anyways, and when I retired from that organization in 1974, so I, I'm juggling both being in the military from 1974 right. to running park, uh, which I retired from in 2014. Well, and, and your family. Yeah, and and the family. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. And, and so, it, it, anyways, to, to make a long story short, that when I did leave Park, we, had, we were serving over 400 individuals with disabilities. The annual budget, I believe, was like 16 million. And so we, we grew that too. And, and like, I, I had strong staff that when I, you know, I, I spent a year in Boston and I, I basically uh, was still running 
apart from Boston, you know, with a distance. <laughs> but they were very good. That, you know, they, they supported me when I was doing military stuff, extremely supported me 100% or I wouldn't have been able to do both, you know. So I know how to juggle between a civilian job <laughs> and a military career. So I and learned can you, that. As you transitioned then, uh, were, were you a nonprofit then under the former Source America? I know it's changed its name as well. But how, how did that evolve into your leadership role now with one of the most dynamic and most successful programs for employees uh, with disabilities, including veterans in the country? How did that evolve then? What brought you to Source America? Well, that's probably a negative story. <laughs> it started out negative. Uh, our park was on the other side of I-15 from Hill Air Force Base. I know right where that is, by the way. And, and I learned, yeah, and I learned about the Ability One program and what it was doing just through the network of what I was involved with. And I, back then the regions were a lot more functioning than they are now. So the, the West region was in California and I contacted the executive director for the West region, told him I knew that there was an opportunity to do part sorting at Hill Air Force Base. And I would like, you know, to, to get a statement of work and see if we could have it set aside and used for the Ability One program. And uh, it all worked out, but they ended up giving it to a nonprofit in Ogden, <laughs> which, which kind of funny how that works. <laughs> and it kind of angered me, I guess is a good way to say it. <laughs> Yeah. And so I started doing some research and found out that the NCSE back then was just called Council of Work Centers. Milt Cohen was still on it. You know, it goes back, clear back. This was like 1984, 80, 1980, yeah, 1984. So about 10 years after we got started. And I was able to, I guess, maneuver myself onto a position with the uh, Council of Work Centers, and uh, and then eventually I became a little more visible, I believe, and we started getting some Ability One contracts. Um, In general, I, I believe as we've gotten to know each other, and again, I, I cherish our friendship and appreciate it. I know your style has been, at least in, as we're working together, is that you see a program, uh, you build upon it, you, you find the strengths and the weaknesses, and then you set out on a mission as the general to make things better. And I, what I hear you saying is that whether you were serving in the military or now helping individuals that need help the most, you're looking for ways to improve upon, it, isn't it? Wouldn't that summarize you pretty well? At least as I know you. Yeah, I, I would probably put that into one quick phrase is continuous improvement. I, I believe con everything is about continuous improvement, you know, and, and I felt that way. And I, I think I, even with my kids and what they learned in school is, you know, well, you only got a B plus. Well, that's great. That's good. But can we do better, you know? And so. <laughs> well, I find yeah. that in your, in your leadership and working with you, because again, I'm, I'm honored to, to call you a friend and the, all the great things you have done for our country but I see it every day when we're chatting and, and working on, again, employment for individuals that need help. Uh, and I know that our, our time is running a little short, but you know, another one of your biggest fans is Rachel that has helped putting this together. I know she's at the, on the other end of this, but she made sure that I, on my notes, we would spend a few moments talking about the hotshot crew. Tell us about that. What? <laughs> Jumping out of a plane to fight fires, that is pretty impressive. Well, I, I, how much time we got? Give me a, give me a time because I'll go into more you detail. You take the time, time that you need, General. You, you take <laughs> the time. I had a job in high school where I was uh, 
I worked for a, a lumber yard and I was the deliver, local delivery guy. I mean, I delivered lumber net construction sites, you know, two by four sheetrock, plywood, that kind of thing. And the secretary that worked in that uh, lumber yard, husband was the, was the ranger for the, the district ranger that was in Heber City, which I grew up in Wasatch County, which is on the back side of the Wasatch by Park City. Everybody's heard of Park City, but Wasatch. Oh, and, re and remember, we we bought your train and took it to Boulder City, Nevada. About this. That's so right. I remember the Heber Creeper, but please, please continue. <laughs> then that goes into a story about riding the tracks. I, I, I will save that one for next time. I, I, <laughs> I love that one. You ride the rail tracks with your car, whatever. <laughs> anyway, anyway. Well, back to being a hot shot. So, so the the lumber yard was owned by a hardware store and the lumber yard was a, a family business that uh two brothers had inherited from their father and they had a parting of ways and so the lumber yard guy moved to richfield utah and they hired a, a general manager to come in and he his thing was is if you're not going to work full time you're not going to work here so are you going to college or are you going to work here well to me that was a no-brainer i'm going to college and that very day that i he told me i wasn't going to be able to work anymore i ran into the secretary that had left there previously about a year before and told her i lost my job and she was with her husband and he says i've got a job <laughs> uh with the forest service do you want it you know and it, I, I mean that was before you had to announce you know it, you had to announce jobs and that so the next month so i lost my job on friday evening and started a new job on monday morning with the forest service and i worked for probably about 10 days and there was a big fire up in salmon idaho and they called all these forests districts to send whatever people they could send so i got was one that was selected to go i think they sent about 12 of us up to salmon idaho and they'd all been seasoned forest service workers but i didn't know anything you just showed up <laughs> yeah and i they were talking about you know slags and all these different kind of mcleod tools and shovels i mean i knew what a shovel was but all these different firefighting Pulaski and things like that. And that ended up getting me through college. I worked for six years for the Forest Service for, for the summers as uh, a Forest Service employee. And you know, the biggest fire I went on was in uh, Inet, uh, Wenatchee National Forest in Washington. And I was gone for 17 days and it was it was pretty cool you know we'd sleep two or three hours every 24 hours i mean it was it was rough but it was you know and then there was but there was you know there was i've been on a number of fires that uh, and and that, but it got me through college and and uh ended up being a, a good career for, for well, and a great platform for your other rest of your public service and you know, General, I appreciate you sh sharing your stories uh, and you and millions of other men and women, especially uh, in the era of the draft, uh, making decisions that are best for you and your family. And we're proud of you for uh, for your years of service. So uh, here again, as we open, this is politics aside. And all I ask is that everyone on the call puts politics aside today and and takes a moment, as you have said, and, and recognize a veteran or more than one uh, as we're now at that special time of the year. And, and I do believe it helps force uh, a time out and all the busy things that we do to recognize these folks. So, uh, General, thank you. Brigadier General Robert P. Daniels, uh, amazing uh, history, amazing public service. So, Thank you very much. General, anything you'd like to say as we're concluding today? Uh, I, I, in return, would like to express my appreciation to engaging me on this. It's been a, it's been a meaningful time for me to, to share my 
experiences, and I, I appreciate that, Congressman. And uh, I, I just echo one more time, find a vet, veteran and thank them for their service and, and even start maybe a conversation and find out a little bit more about them and what they've done. Absolutely. Well, again, all of our best, and uh, thank you for your time, General. Mm -hmm. My best thank again to your family as well and for your public service and their public service. All yep. the best. Thank you for joining us on Politics Society. You're welcome.